Jeff, you can be up here with me. I can. <laughs> Two of you. <laughs> Anyways, at this time, um, I, I really wanted Andre to be the one to share the message tonight. Uh, but what I wanted to do was also, not just by myself, but I also wanted him to help me out too. Is that I want to be able to help answer some questions. Because a lot of my ministry that I do is that I don't just want to just preach. Um, I want to help people who are still wrestling with some doubts in their mind. Sometimes we could hear a message and then we go home. And some stuff, we, we show wrestle with some ideas that we have that's conflicting with something that we've been taught. But before that, one thing that I really want to mention is this. Whatever you believe about love, you believe about God. Whatever you believe about love, you believe about God. And whatever you believe about God, ultimately you will live it out in your life. Yeah. So if you have this schizophrenic God that Andre was talking about that many people have, you're going to have a very schizophrenic lifestyle. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So what I really want to do here, I, re I really want to just give some of my perspective of how, on my own journey, of how I've started to understand Stand God and had to unlearn and learn a lot of things. So, do you have a question, bro? Uh, I have a question. Just if you can kind of talk about wrath, because okay. there's a lot, and as a preacher, you get, I have some ideas about that, but I want to sure. hear you guys kind of touch on that about the wrath of God. Because people say, yes, this is great, but okay. there's a coming wrath still yeah. of yeah. You know, the children of disobedience and things like that. You can yeah. talk about what that means. Okay, you heard me. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, his question was about wrath, so I'm going to repeat the question, because here we have this message about God and His love, but many of us, we've heard a lot of critics will say, well, God is a God of love, but you guys don't forget, He's also a God of wrath, wrath and He's also a God of justice. Yeah. So when you really think about that, folks, with our Western legal mind, would you really just tell Hitler, God loves you and everything's okay? There's no wrath, there's no anger, there's no punishment. Right? These are the, the things that we hear from people, right? Now here's the interesting part, is that many people, I believe, they make a false dichotomy when they say, hey, 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 God is a God of love, but He's also a God of wrath. But if you reflect on that question or accusation, there's a false dichotomy that's already made. Because all of a sudden, you're separating God's love from God's wrath. Ultimately, God is love so at the core of God's being in essence God is love everything that God does is love including his wrath including his justice or else all of a sudden when his wrath comes as so many so, you know some people interpret that as a very bad thing then he must be very unloving at that moment <laughs> to people who don't like him back right and that's the one, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to point out is that we have a very schizophrenic God that we've been taught in many places in America and all over the world, even in the Philippines. I'm from the Philippines, too. It's kind of like, God loves you so much. Oh, that makes me feel so good. But if you don't like him back, he will supernaturally sustain you for billions and billions and trillions and trillions of years in a place of eternal punishment and wrath and his anger is full force against you. Uh, who wouldn't believe them? <laughs> you get what I'm saying, right? So I, I, this is I'm going to give credit to Steve McVeigh because I really appreciate Steve McVeigh's take on this. He talked about this word wrath. That at the core, God is love. And if you look at the original meaning of the word wrath, what does it mean in the Greek? If anyone's familiar, it's a funny word, orgiv. Now we're all adults here except those kids, right? You get two words that come from this word. Orgy. Number one, you get the word orgy. You also get the word orgasm. Now, if we get those two words that are coming from that word orgy, and we automatically assume that wrath means you're angry, you're pissed off. Okay? When you think of those two words, do you think of anger? <laughs> Not really. Right? But when you look it up on your own, and this is a beautiful thing about the internet, you don't have to be a theologian to know God. Okay? But the good thing about it is that many people have been able to demonstrate that when you look at the word organ, the original meaning, it can mean several things. You can't, we cannot deny that it does mean anger. But once again, every word is determined by its context. Right? Okay? 
It can mean anger, but check this out. It can also mean a violent or intense emotion. A violent or intense emotion. So what if God's love and God's wrath is not in conflict, but God's wrath is His violent and intense emotion for you? Come on, man. Right? So for example, if I have a kid, right? If my kid is out there, I like this is an example that they used to make vague. If you have a kid out there, he's playing with a snake, or there's a swarm of bees there, you're just messing around in the backyard. As your father who loves your child unconditionally, you're going to run to your child, you're going to try to grab that snake from his hand because of your intense love to save him from that, from getting hurt. But in your child's eyes, he's looking at you with a fire in your eyes saying, no, don't do that, right? Because that's what sin can do to us. So it's not that he's against you. Like all of a sudden he loves you, but once you die or once you do something stupid, it's over. You better watch out, folks. <laughs> that's a scary God. That's fear. That's what religion has done. That, you know, religion has messed up this world, really. And what I'm trying to do, what Andre's trying to do, and I'm sure what you are trying to do, we're trying to get rid of religion. Let's bring God back in the picture. But yeah. it's unconditional love. Yeah. Right? So his wrath, when you read it within the context of the book of Romans and another passage, try reading it through that lens. Because like I said, us Westerners, we automatically assume anger. Right? So I don't know if I've answered that too much. Okay, and I can keep on going, but I'm just saying, Andre, you want to add on? Yeah, let me grab. Can I oh, this on? You keep doing this back and forth. Yes, <laughs> thank you. That's a good question. And, uh, Beautiful answer as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I love the, I love the. Um, so if you if you have to put another word into it, Bob, is passion. Yeah. Um, and so has God ever got angry? You know, God's anger. God, which is mostly what we understand about wrath. Is against the thing that stood between us. <laughs> so yes, yeah. you know, if somebody w wants to put something in between Mary Ann and myself, I, I am going to get really kicked off. But not at Mary Ann, but at the thing that's between us. And so when when it says, um, for instance, Jesus says. Uh, um, those of you who believe are, are, are not condemned, uh, uh, those of who believe are not condemned, those who do not believe are condemned already. Because what does that mean? It's my very unbelief, my very un uh, the very fact that I do not accept his acceptance of me that's going to cause me to live in a way where I do not experience that approval, that acceptance. And it says the wrath of God or the passion of God remains upon him, and that's a good thing. Right. <laughs> so, in terms of judgment, I uh, I want to make this uh, a bit because obviously we're going to get these questions continually. <laughs> we, but you know what? If you don't if you don't if you don't um, respond correctly, judgment is coming. What I want to say is what happened in Jesus really happened. It's not just potential. Come on. He, he dealt with the sin of the world in that moment. And so there is no judgment to come that will dishonor the judgment that happened in Christ. There is no judgment to come where God's going to change his mind and say, Oh, you know, I was a little bit too lenient in Christ, but now... Um, <laughs> Yeah. No, God's never going to dishonor Come on. the moment in which yeah. he, the fullness of time, God, God summarized everything on heaven and earth, and despite the fact that you deserve death, He judged that to make things right, I'm going to give you life despite anything you've, you've deserved. God's never going to change. He's always going to be that God whose judgment is. Come on. I'll give you who I am, no matter what you deserve. Yeah, come on. Now we can make our own hell out of that in not accepting what He has given, and I don't even have to theorize about the future. I can just get involved in people's lives around me to know that 
there is very real suffering and torment. And it's not because God has not forgiven or God has not embraced. It's because people have not embraced what he has given. And so, you know, even the word punishment, as we start dealing with our language, where as I started moving away from just the legal terminology to getting back to the heart of the gospel, when I thought of the word punishment, um, you know, when my children was young, when my son was young, and he uh, came into the kitchen and he wanted to put his hand on the stove, I slap his hand and I say, no, don't touch that, it's hot. Uh, and so that's a form of punishment, a form of <coughs> discipline. But I discipline him and I punish him because I want to save him from the consequences of his ignorance so that he will learn that that is going to hurt. And so when he grew up, if he came into the kitchen and he put his hand on a warm plate or a stove plate you is that what you call it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he's older and he do this and he burns himself that is not my punishment that is the consequences of the fact that he did not learn from me disciplining him when he was younger now unfortunately when we look at this world and everything that goes wrong we sometimes think everything that goes wrong in people's lives is God's punishment. Now, that, now that, that stuff is just the natural consequences of sin. And, and sin is not just you've done something wrong and God's going to get it. No, sin is a, the, the, the destructive thoughts and habits that obviously gives birth to destructive lifestyles and, and the consequences of such lifestyle is, is destructive but it's not because God's involved punishing and being angry it's because they've never learned from God's this is Hebrews 12 the reason that this father disciplines is because he loves because he teaches because he wants to bring us through all these things so the only the only wrath that remains is God is as passionate as he has ever been to remove everything that stood between us and even the misconceptions that people have of him now he's still as committed to removing those obstacles I hope that it helps a bit right. and I'll even add on when you think about this too why do we automatically assume judgment of your sin Right, when we think of judgment, we think you're going to be judged for your sin. The book of John talks about that Jesus is a Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the Christians. Jesus is a Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of those who repent just right. Jesus is a Lamb of God to take away the sins of those who believe just right. right? Jesus is a Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. So if the judgment is not necessarily about sin, then maybe it's not about that. And maybe it's more so about relationships. Whether you know him or not. Because your sins were already with him 2,000 years ago on the cross. Yeah. And when we think of the word fire, when we see the word fire in the Bible, what do we automatically assume? We think of judgment. Because we think of the lake of fire. But why? Why do we automatically assume evil when we see the word fire or lake of fire? When we could talk about Malachi talking about a refiner's fire. Or a launderer's soap. Right? And while all of a sudden, when we, when we read the Bible, we, 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 we kind of translate it different for unbelievers. That when we see the word fire, it's purification for a Christian. But when it's unbeliever, fire means damnation, going to hell forever. Mm -hmm. Why do we make that switch? Right? And another thing, because you might be saying, Josh, Andre, that's nice what you're saying. But when I read my Bible, anger and wrath is there in the book of Romans. Now, let me give you a little perspective on that. There's been a change in recent scholarship of how to read the book of Romans. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Because when you read the book of Romans, except especially chapters 1 through 3, you're going to see a very schizophrenic God within the book of Romans. Because in the first chapters 1 through 3, you're going to see a very judgmental, angry, because Paul is saying, wrath is coming, gay people, watch out. You guys familiar with that? It's in the Bible, right? Then all of a sudden, in the other chapters, you're going to see a God of grace, that Jesus is greater than Adam, and he saved you, right? So you see this schizophrenic God. So how do you reconcile that? Here's what people are starting to see and understand now. Paul 
in that time, he's addressing an audience in these chapters 1 through 3 of those people who are crying out for God's justice and his wrath to come for the Gentile outside sinners. Right? He's, a, he's responding to an audience. How do I know that? Because when you look at that in Romans chapter 1, you're going to see that scary version of God, watch out. Now all of a sudden he flips it around, he turns the tables around on the Jewish people and he says, hey, but if this wrath is coming, what about you? You deserve it as well. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Right? So in other words, he's responding to two things, basically. Number one, he's responding to a critic of those people who are crying out for God's justice for the Gentile outsiders. And number two, he's responding to some people who are accusing him of libertinism, meaning do whatever you want because you're under grace. Remember Romans chapter 6? The more I sin, the more grace abounds. And he responds to those things as well. So it's not like Paul, on some bad days, he just writes one through three and God's this really mean jerk. <laughs> like you better watch out. And all of a sudden he changes his mind in the second chapter. He's responding to those critics who are crying out for those things and they're revealing the true God that in Christ he has reconciled the whole world mm -hmm. while you were still powerless sinners and enemies mm -hmm. in your minds. Mm -hmm. So God never changed. We change. And just like his book is Metanoia, we don't change God's mind. His love, his unconditional love and sacrificial death is to change our mind about him. Right? God is a good God. Okay. Next question. Next question. Yeah. A little bit on this thing. How would you like describe um, like Noah's Ark? Like everybody was just killed off in the world, or uh, even Sodom and Gomorrah, they were all burned. And then to jump to the New Testament, even Revelations talk about yeah. angels coming down and doing stuff. So I don't know how you would kind of interpret those or what yeah. different take would be. Because I know the Bible says God is the same yesterday, and today, and forever. So you try to look at God the same in the New Testament and the Old Testament, but sometimes you know, it's hard to know. <laughs> Rod, do I have permission? <laughs> Andre, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'll go on. So, so again, Jesus, Matthew 11, 27, he comes and he says, no one knows the Father except the Son. In other words, throughout all this Old Testament history, and through people studying those stories and those scriptures, all those stories did not lead them to an accurate understanding and relationship with God. And, and in effect, he, uh, Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3 says, In times past, God spoke in fragments and pieces to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken a final word in His Son. In other words, we should not deal with the shadows as if it's substance. And this, if we go and read those Old Testament stories outside of the context of the incarnation of Jesus, we're going to be as confused as the people who read it all, studied it all, and no one knew it. And it came to New Testament times. So, yes, some thoughts concerning interpreting the Old Testament stories, and I love them, and I continue to see more and more in them, but... Just some, some insights as to how to study it. Um, for instance, in Job 42 verse 7, God tells Eliabas, one of Job's friends, um, what you and your friends have said about me is not true. Now we've got chapters full of conversation of what they said about God and most Christians will have no problem quoting any one of those scriptures and say that that's in the Bible. So that's true, but God himself said that what's in the Bible is not true. <laughs> okay, so, um, so here's an idea. <laughs> The, the, the scriptures is a conversation between God and man. So the scriptures contains both 
the beginning of God's self-revelation towards man, but it also contains man's ideas about God and man's fallen ideas about God. So some of the ideas are great and some are rotten. So when we read the Old Testament scriptures, we, we need to understand that we are busy peering into a conversation. Let me give you a quick taster. We're going to go into depth of this tomorrow. The scripture says God does not require sacrifices and offerings. But why does he then set up a whole temple system and institute sacrifices and, and ultimately brings about the perfect sacrifice in Christ if he doesn't require it? <laughs> now, the fact is, for instance, with Abraham, Abraham lives in the context of a society where child sacrifices are common. And most of your your ancient societies have got human sacrifices at the heart of it. And he lives in this place where it is common for the gods to ask your best, to ask for your child, your wife, whatever, as a sacrifice. And so when God comes to Abraham and he says, offer up Isaac, that is a very common request that you would expect from any of the gods. <laughs> But just before Abraham sacrifices Isaac, God stops him. And in that act, God starts revealing to Abraham, I am not like all the other gods. Now why did he take him through that process? Because God's got to come and speak on a level and in a language that we understand. And in the contrast to all the fancy methodology that we've told ourselves, he's got to come and reveal the truth. And so, the stories in the Bible, all of them has got mythical equivalents. And sometimes the myths are older than the stories that's in the Bible. They were recorded before that. But at every point where the myths try to conceal the truth, the scriptures reveal it uh, and expose it. And so I can see how throughout the Old Testament scriptures, God is entering into a conversation with man on a level that man can understand for the very purpose of subverting it and turning it upside down. And the ultimate subversion comes in Jesus. And he's God's final word. Mm -hmm. And if something that I don't, something that I read about God, if that is yeah. not what I yeah. see in Jesus, yeah. then I've got to say, Jesus is the ultimate authority. So what we've tried to do is we've yeah. tried to balance everything. We've tried to say, Jesus said, love your enemies. But, you know, there was also the time where he said, go and bash their babies against stones. And... And we want to give both equal play. No, they're not equal. <laughs> God spoke a final word in Jesus. And Jesus' revelation of the Father is, love your enemies. <laughs> and so, how we now understand those scriptures where, which seems to contradict, that becomes the most beautiful interesting conversation where we've got to look at those stories much more critical than what we've done before and say is that part of man trying to come to grips with the understanding of who God is and who we are or is that really God revealing himself that's a little bit just on the interpretation of Old Testament stories thanks I'll just add on to this do you guys consider yourself a new a new covenant church oh, yeah right yes. of course now isn't it possible you could write a letter to a friend or you could write a book about christianity or god and then you could be incorrect about something about your perception of who god is possible and then we look at the old testament of people who are under the older covenant the more inferior covenant and then we can assume that every perception that they had was true you guys seeing where I'm coming from? Like what he was talking about, a lot of mythology. 
pagan worldviews, ancient Near Eastern worldviews, right? Because we really, this is one of the reasons why there are so many non-Christians and atheists out there. Right? Because they read our book, and we constantly claim that it's a love letter, and in some cases, it is about love. But there are many stories in there that looks nothing like love, and it looks nothing like Christ. Right? There's so many things that I can mention, we were talking about it last night, you know. But I want you to consider it like this. I want you to imagine that we could look, I, I, I was in New York a couple weeks ago speaking there and I saw a children's book about Noah's Ark. We talk about the beautiful story where we focus on the positive part of, about God saving this family. But I want you to look at it from another perspective. Who was wiped out? The rest of the whole world. That could have been you or your family, but we just focus on this family. But yet after they were saved from the flood, after that, he gets drunk and he has incest. Yet he was a holy man. So there's these interesting stories that we can have. I want you to imagine that one day you're eating dinner with your kids, with your spouse. And then one day, a bunch of guys come into your house. They take your daughters. They cut their heads off of your, your, your sons. They kill your husband. And they say they're doing it all in the name of God. Folks, that's in the Bible. We have to keep in mind their worldview that they had. No, I am not denying the historicity of the scriptures, folks. I'm not denying that. What I'm challenging is a perception of those people during that time that were continually growing in our knowledge of who He is. And yet Christ is a final revelation or the full revelation of who God is. That when you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. I encourage you to even read Deuteronomy 20 and 21. And you'll see stories in there of God, not man, but God commanding the people to go to a particular town. I want you to declare peace to them. And if they don't accept your peace, I want you to kill everybody, even the children. Show no mercy. Does that look like Christ? <coughs> Does not look like Christ? But it's in our book. It's in our book. And we have to deal with that. Then he says, well, after that, I want you to take the women that you want. Basically, they're sex slaves. You shave off their heads, cut out their nails, <coughs> then when you're tired of them, you can drop them. That's in Deuteronomy. Psalms talks about happy are those who takes a baby's head and bashes it against a rock. How do you explain that? Did you know too? That's why you can look at those stories, folks. We have to keep in mind that the ancient Near Eastern culture, they believed in pagan gods, where they actually believed that if you sacrifice your own child unto God, God will give you victory in the battle. Do you remember those stories? God will let us win this victory. That was a pagan mentality, folks. Because if you were to take this so, if you support this kind of worldview that we find in the Old Testament, we should support it now. When we look at 9-11 of what happened, when people kill in the name of God, why do us Christians find that sickening? But yet it's in our book of God doing the same thing. Why can we look at the people in Japan with the tsunami happening. And why not assume that it's God judging them? We have to believe that this, that this Bible that we have is a conversation. That it's a journey of God revealing Himself and unfolding His character. Not that God's changing throughout time. Because mm -hmm. that wouldn't be fair right, for the people back then. But over time, there's this progressive revelation of who God is. And then Christ, once again, is a full revelation of saying, You've heard it said. You've heard it said. It was in your law. But I tell you, turn the other cheek. Mm -hmm. right? But it's contradicting the scriptures. Right? This is scary for some people. So I'm not saying throw away your book. Right? There's a lot of treasure and gold nuggets in there. But just like every book, it's man's inspired words about God where we can sometimes get it right and sometimes we can get it wrong. I like what Brian McLaren said, that when you read the Bible, try not treating it like a constitution. That's why we have these Facebook wars, these debates, right? Isn't it funny when you have someone that you disagree with, you just quote all these Bible verses, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you treat yeah. it like a constitution wow. where you yeah. forcibly yeah. have to agree yeah. to it. Or, so, or we have these hot topics nowadays where we say, well, what about abortion? Well, the Bible says, well, now we can't think anymore. Because it's not really what the Bible says, it's actually your interpretation of what the Bible says. Right? That's what we have to challenge now. Or we can't talk about stem cell research because the Bible says, 
according to my interpretation. Now, so many people have used the Bible to shut people up and to not get them to think. And I'm telling you, I don't think the Bible was meant to be used as a constitution to bring out all these verses to get you to shut up and just listen to what I have to say. When in, when in fact, it might just be their interpretation. Right? As Christians, we can't disagree. We can't even agree sometimes. But what if the Bible, instead of it being a constitution, you see it as a library of a collection of stories of people who have genuinely experienced God, just like you and me, where sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong. And now in our generation, 2013, they're inviting us along this journey to come to know who God is, that maybe 10 or 15 years from now, our children, our grandchildren will have a better understanding of God because they were open to the Spirit's work. And that's why there were many people, even within the New Testament folks, who had no scriptures, but they lived according to the Spirit. So we read the scriptures, not to necessarily give us new revelation of God, because the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, is in every single one of you. But when we read the scriptures, it confirms and reminds us of what we already know here, but what religion has polluted. That's my answer for that one. I can, um, I can just suggest concerning the book of Revelation, one of the amazing best books I've ever written. Oh. <laughs> read. <laughs> the best book I've ever read on the book of Revelations is a book called Compassionate Eschatology. Oh, Michael Hardy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very, very good stuff. That's good stuff. Gives you a perspective that you don't often get in the fiction that's written. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you. I had a question about uh, the gospel, and I, I talked to you a little bit as we were opening just about the question. If you would just speak to it for a moment regarding if, as God has, has reconciled all mankind to himself, yes. how is it that some do not receive salvation? Yes. I mean, I, I get the kind of the, the um, well, the long held view of. of you know, of salvation and the gospel holds what you spoke, you know, yes. sort of against a moment ago, that that, that there was a potential yes. reconciliation, a potential accomplishment yes. of Jesus, yes. and that it becomes fulfilled if we choose mm -hmm. it. And, <clears throat> and yet it does seem that a choice is involved somewhere along the way. Yes. And anyway, if you wouldn't mind, just speak uh, to the gospel and its relationship <coughs> to that um, all mankind is reconciled, and yet not all are saved. Yes. Okay. <coughs> such, such an important question. So I want to deal with two parts of it. On the one part, I want to just show what God has done. And on the other part, I want to show man's response to what God has done. Now, the, the way many of us have grown up, is we thought that the moment where we make a decision and we come to faith is the moment where all these things became real. We thought that the moment in which I decide and I place my faith in Christ, that's the moment in which He forgives me and the moment in which I'm reconciled to God. I have become absolutely convinced that something happened in Christ that is not just of potential benefit to all of mankind, but when one died for all, all indeed died together with him. So we invent language to try and deal with this problem to say, well, it was legally true, but vitally it's not. And, and the reason the, the Bible doesn't use such language is because Paul and the guys just spoke about the death of Jesus and his resurrection as if it's reality. <laughs> they didn't try and divide it up or try and reduce the effect, but they just stood in awe at the reality of what he did when he embraced the world and removed every sin between every man and himself. So let me make it as clear as possible. I believe that in the death of Christ, he dealt with every sin of every man in all time, once and for all, so thoroughly that he removed sin from his own consciousness. 
So that there is nothing in God's thoughts about man that reminds him of sin. God is absolutely convinced of the success of what He's done in Christ in, in reconciling the world to Himself. But you see, it's because religion made forgiveness or innocence the goal that we get confused when we say God's already done it. When we say but but then there's nothing to do. I mean, then why do people live this way? Well, innocence and forgiveness was never the goal. That was just the minimum requirement to get to the actual goal, which is romance, which is intimacy. Come on. Now, a, a romance anticipates a response. A romance anticipates a a, 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 a flow, a dynamic flow between more than one and, and, and so when I went to Mary Ann and I declared my love for her I did it nervously because I knew that there was the very real possibility of rejection I, I knew that, that she could just fall double with laughter and I'd be totally embarrassed which by the way is exactly what she did <laughs> And I was very embarrassed. <laughs> but I did it. But imagine this. If I went to her and I said, Mary Ann, I want to just tell you how much I love you. And, and I'm convinced that this is God's will for us to be together. And, and, um, uh, and I hope you make the right choice. You know, these are the three steps to appropriately respond to my own life. I'll give you some time to consider this, but... Um, oh yes, by the way, if you do not love me, I will torture you forever. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, that is how ridiculous our presentation of the Gospel has been. How we've reduced the romance of this universe to some, uh, some man-made mechanical steps in which we want to force people into a relationship. And we do that when our gospel lacks the beauty to draw a response and love from people where we try and enforce a response. The gospel is the first and foremost not telling people how they should respond, but making clear to them what God has done independent of their response, independent of how they react. God has just come and He has wasted His life upon you without any guarantee that you would respond appropriately or lovingly. And we declare that in such a way in the absolute anticipation that I want a response. How people sometimes theologically they tell me how oh, you preaching that it doesn't matter what people believe. Now these are armchair theologians that sit at home and debate about what God is, uh, means while we in a different place every two, three days pouring our hearts out to people be and we wouldn't do that if what people believe did not matter. Wow. Come on. It matters Come on. enormously. Come on. But that's not our message. Just, that's just the natural result of revealing the heart of God. Is people respond in gratitude and faith to who He is. And that's necessary for intimacy. But just like I didn't go and tell my wife, this is how you need to respond to my great love. Because there's no possibility of romance in such a ridiculous message. I just came and, and I was willing to embarrass myself and just declare to her what I felt 
Well, how I love the, in the hope, in the hope that there would be a response. So, in our proclamation throughout the world, we focus on what God believes, what He has done, with the absolute anticipation that God knows how to awaken love, how to awaken a response, how to awaken faith. And God has given us this enormous privilege of being part of that moment of romance in which we lift the veil of a person's wow. understanding and see this romance unfold. See the bride kissing the bridegroom. I mean, what a privilege we have. There's no greater motivation than going about and just lifting veils. <laughs> so excited that a romance is going to be born here. But you don't know the end of what's going to happen because of this. So undoubtedly a response is our goal. But it is never our message. It's, you know, it's because we think that everything that we've worked out, we should preach. No, you, you don't need to. You know, don't need to preach everything you believe. I mean, that's stupid. Come <laughs> on. Um, you are dealing with people in the grip of myths and and deception. You need God's strategy to awaken a response. And, and the reason I don't preach how you need to respond is because I want to be most effective in getting a response. And the least effective way of getting a response is to tell people how to respond. <laughs> The least effective way for me to have began a romance with Mary Ann would have been this is my great love for you and these are the three steps in which you should appropriately respond to my great love. Close your eyes. Put up your hand. Fill in this form. Declare to me your undying love. God, this gospel is the power of God to awaken appropriate responses and the response that can never be measured with, with our stupid statistics. Yeah. You can't measure faith. You can't measure romance. We've got to just place our trust that in declaring the heart of God, the response will come. Sorry, I'm remembering your question. So God has done what He has done. Undoubtedly, we want people to respond. If people don't respond, that's ultimately the question. What, what happens then? So, you see, we want one word to mean one thing in our Western thinking. We want salvation to mean one thing and the process. To, but the, again, the writers of the Scriptures use the same word to mean different things. And they may use different words to mean the same thing. And, uh, and so, for instance, the scripture says, Jesus is the Savior of all men. So on the basis of that, that scripture, I can say, if Jesus is who He says He is, the Savior of all men, and, he was, and He's successful in who He is, then I've got to say all men are saved. But then in that same book he says, and God desires that all men should come to salvation. And it should be saved. So now he uses it in a different perspective. And come to the knowledge of truth. What truth? The truth that he has saved you. It's like Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 that says, God has reconciled the world to himself, but now he makes his appeal through us. Be reconciled. In other words, from God's perspective, what needed to be done is done. 
From God's perspective, there's no obstacle between us. From God's perspective, you are forgiven. But that's not the end of the, where we're going. That is just the beginning. The end is romance. And so we appeal to people. Now be what you are. Woo. <laughs> be the forgiven, innocent, righteous, beautiful one that He made you to be. And God never changes. Yeah. There are people living in a hell of torment and suffering now. And it's not because God does not love them. It's not because God has not embraced them. That older brother of the prodigal brother that, that did not enter the party. His hell was made so much worse because he was so close to the party mm. that he could smell the food, he could hear the music, but he did not enjoy anything of it. His hell was being with the Father but not knowing Him. Mm. Wow. His suffering was ha having everything given to Him but not enjoying anything. Wow, and so we've got to know that people are suffering and and you know, maybe that suffering continues even beyond this life, but it's not because God enforces a suffering upon them because of His offense with them. In the face of the greatest offense, He has embraced us. And it's because His love is so absolutely relentless that He will never let us go. But some people experience it as suffering because no matter how they fight it, God won't change. But we create our own suffering. And so, you know, we'll, we'll all hear, we'll all, I'm just so grateful that this life, right here, right now, let's forget about <coughs> speculating about the future and start realizing again what God has done and the implications for my present life mm -hmm. because if we don't understand the implications for my present moment of what he has done then our speculations of what it means for the future will always be skewed and mostly people who speculate about that is it's not interested in really the character or nature of God. They're just interested in getting all their theories neatly in yeah. control. And, and let's just focus back on what God has done. And that's undoubtedly all-inclusive. And the result of what He has done means that I can live a life that embraces every person I meet. That yeah. loves every come person I come into contact that invites them into this fellowship that I've discovered. That's the conclusion. <laughs> now, obviously, when we see God for who He is, it also shows us that He's going to be the same forever. Does that help a bit? Yes, thank you. Do you want to add to the question, or is that...? No, I don't need to add to it. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. It's a very important dis uh, distinction that people have to make that I think in the Western gospel that we have now, it's a conditional gospel. You have to do something like you have to acknowledge your sins, you have to confess, you repent, and you believe, and then you're in. That's the Western gospel that we have. Now here's a very important distinction. What if acknowledging, confessing, and repenting, and believing are not requirements in order to be accepted and loved by God? But listen here. Instead of them being requirements, they're merely responses. Hmm to knowing that because of his unconditional love yes. you already accepted yes. and that you already belong to him Absolutely. there's a big difference Absolutely. now I, what I've been taught my whole life was this potential gospel right? it's an invitation yeah. right? like God's not there, it's all of a sudden you do a service does anybody want to accept Christ into his heart as a personal Lord and Savior and all of a sudden say yeah I, already, I found Christ at such and such age, you didn't find Christ first fight, Christ found you come on he was already there. You invited this God out there into your heart because, but other than that, all those years before you did that, He was not there? How do you think you even got to that point of wanting to know God unless He was already there? Working in your heart, getting your attention here and there, trying to wake you up, but you were constantly being deceived by the lies and that darkness, right? But you didn't jump from one column to the other. You're always in Him even before you were born. 
That was his dream. Now this is very simple. I can love my wife unconditionally. But if she doesn't believe that, consciously she won't experience that. And we've all experienced this in our marriages. Sometimes, whether it could be a boy or a girl, your partner, you just like, do you love me? Yeah, I told you already, right? We can sometimes get like that. But her lack of belief in the truth of the reality that I unconditionally accept her and love her doesn't change the reality. Now check this out. There's this objective reality that Christ has already revealed and reconciled the whole world. But when you believe, that's when the subjective experience happens. But that belief doesn't change God's acceptance of you. Now here's a very important verse that many Christians are afraid to acknowledge. 1 Timothy 4.10 God is a savior of all men to those who believe. God is a savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Because he objectively already saved and redeemed the whole world, but you will subjectively experience when you start to believe. Come on. You see that? So the gospel that we're sharing now, it's not a potential gospel. It's not an invitation. It's a declaration. It is finished. Believe the good news. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's already there yes. in your heart, whether you believe in it or not. And the good news is that wake you up and say, open your eyes. Open your eyes. It's not to get God out there inside your heart. He's already there. You already accept it. You already include it. Amen. Good news, dude. I'm getting close up. Yeah. 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 I don't know what, what time I'm on, so I just I don't want to. Okay. You're at eight. One or two more questions. It's up to you guys. I don't want you guys to. I can, um, I can maybe just. I so enjoyed that question. It's so yeah. essential. And I want to um, tell you what, what uh, T.F. Torrance answered. It, it's another little book that I can highly recommend. It's called Movements of Grace. One of his students wrote this. And um, at one stage, when people started understanding that he believes that the humanity of Jesus is what represents all of humanity, and, and in the idea that it was our decision that brought us into relationship with God, they asked him, um, so tell us, when did you become a son of God? And, and I love this answer. He, he said, I became a son of God, first of all, when the Father imagined me, dreamed me, and when I began in the heart and mind of God before time began. I became a son of God secondly, when God came and decisively displayed his, his thoughts about me. And as Peter says, I was born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Says, thirdly, I became a child of God when I heard the gospel and the Spirit of God came to seal within my faith and within my experience what was true before time began and was the, what was displayed decisively in Christ now became reality in my, my present moment. And he said, we can never separate those three moments. <laughs> But because, you know, our decision and our faith is the only moment that we're really aware of when we first make a decision for Christ, that for many people remains their only reference. Because that's when everything changes in our experience. But we've got to see that we have got a much larger and solid reference than just our decision. That was a beautiful moment, but you couldn't make a decision for God unless He made one for you. Woo! The only reason you could is because He did. <laughs> Come on. And so we've got this beautiful moment of what began before time began, what was decisively <laughs> concluded in Christ and what is sealed in our faith and experience. I also, maybe I'll just conclude as well, the for the whole night and the messages that, that came out and even the attitude towards scripture. Um, our attitude towards scripture is, <laughs> it's not there to confuse or to, to bring um, uneasiness. I mean the greatest wars, the greatest 
uh, the greatest struggle in relationship has happened between nations, groups and people who were totally, fundamentally dedicated to their interpretation of the scriptures. And so we've got to see that people like Peter, Paul, these guys, they didn't even have the scriptures. Like they had the Old Testament mainly memorized, but access to it as well. But what was the word that captivated them? What was the word that they wanted to explain and wanted to interpret to their hearers? Was the word made flesh. This Jesus who became the Logos of God, who became flesh and now made His home in us. How to explain Him? How to reveal Him? And when I realized that this scripture is a mirror that's there to, to bring me face to face with the reality of Christ in me, it becomes so much more valuable because when you look at the mirror, where is the substance? Is it in the mirror? Or does the mirror just display the substance? The substance of the gospel is the person of Christ Jesus. And the person of Christ Jesus is in you. The mystery revealed is not Christ in the Bible. The mystery revealed is not Christ in history or Christ in the future. The mystery revealed is Christ in you. And the scriptures comes to just unfold that reality. And to start seeing it through, through the perspective of the incarnation, through the living Christ, adds so much value. I so enjoy the scriptures. Mm. I tell you, I've, I enjoy the scriptures more than ever before. And I, I, every six months I feel like I want to read everything over mm. again. Because, you know, Christ brings this revelation and this language and just gives such insight into it. So, I want to affirm that the scriptures has got tremendous value. But it doesn't have value because it is the inerrant Word of God. That will leave you totally confused. Because there's so many contradictions. I mean, uh, um, there's a book I can re recommend, Misquoting Jesus. Uh, it's a scholar that critically looks at the scriptures. I mean, there's more variations in the Greek between the different transcripts of the scriptures than what they are words in the Bible. <laughs> okay. So we've got to get to the heart yeah. of the message. And what God wanted to communicate is beautifully still displayed in the scriptures. And the reason he didn't capture a, a photo perfect image within the lines of the Bible is because he doesn't want you to relate to him just through black and white letters. He wants through his spirit to teach you the meaning and the beauty of the scripture. He, he's excited about this journey of discovery. And so the scriptures are beautifully valuable. But don't ever <laughs> Think that our descriptions of God replaces God Himself. Come on. It's not idolize the book and ignore the person. God has committed Himself to you, invested Himself in you. Now, what the, I, I know there was a. Are you. I wonder, maybe we'll do it Sunday. We'll just pray for a few people as well that have sickness and things. But I think that's, that's all right for tonight. You do that so right? in. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph.